Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Amanda Riggenbach. I am a new museum educator here at the Riverfront Museum. And we are just so happy to welcome Carrie Grady and Ed Sitkowski um, to talk about the art of graphic design. Um, please join us after the program for a reception catered by Sids in the Park, um, where you can talk to Carrie and just you know, enjoy some fellowship. Um, and to introduce the Riverfront Museum, here is our president and CEO, John Morris. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everybody. You uh, win the prize. <laughs> the most beautiful day of the year. And you are here with Ed Sikowski and Kerry Grady. So give yourself an applause. <laughs> Ed will introduce Carrie in a few minutes, but I hold in my hand a remarkable book on sale in the store right now. It'll be available for Carrie to sign afterwards that Ed will certainly be talking about. But this continues a wonderful tradition here at the only Museum of Art, Science, History, and Achievement in the nation, the Peoria Riverfront Museum, a privately funded institution of inspiration. So for those who are members or visionary society members, we thank you for all you do uh, to support our efforts here. We thank Linda and Ed Sikowski, great friends of the museum, for this program and previous and future programs in which we bring fascinating, interesting people to the Peoria Riverfront Museum whose stories will lift us all up. I have to say that out in the lobby as you passed by, the little McCord Gallery that is across from the clock tower. You will see uh, beautiful designs in our first of its kind exhibition in that little clock tower gallery of Carrie Grady's work. So you all saw that coming in? Today we are live streaming this program. It will be recorded so you are a studio audience as well as a live audience today. And we find that hundreds more enjoy these programs from sometimes across the country. All of Carrie's long lost relatives will <laughs> hopefully be watching. Uh, Carrie Grady is not only a guest for Ed Sikowski's interesting people style interview today, but he is a great new friend to the Peoria Riverfront Museum and to Peoria. So we welcome Carrie Grady and to introduce him and Another fascinating interview in the series, Ed Sikowski. Thank you, John. The usual stipend, I, I'll leave the cash out on your desk <laughs> as I leave. Uh, the free parking is in uh, also with donuts and everything else, John. Um, and, and the beauty of that is then John has agreed to uh, purchase several sets of shoes for Miss Linda, which is a good <laughs> burden off of my back. But all kidding aside, Carrie, um, I've come to know you through uh, mutual friends and whatever, and, and I'm trying to figure out what, what are you all about? What, what, is, what is Carrie Grady about? What does he stand for? Um, well, my wife's in the audience. You might start there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, what am I all about? Uh, well, actually, I don't think it's that big of a deal, frankly. You know, I, I was born in Iowa, and um, you learn pretty quickly in Iowa, we're all pretty much the same. And um, so what we do professionally or, you know, in, in terms of how we spend our days and times and our interests, you know, it's... it's um, you know, it's our story, but it's not necessarily any different or better than anyone else's story. And so time flies, as you know, and 40, 50, 60 years in, you kind of wonder, like, well, how did that happen? And um, you don't always have that uh, projection when you're young that, you know, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But I kind of had an idea, and and I'm curious. So I think that's part of the story is that, uh, you know, I grew up in a, place called Muscatine, Iowa. It's a nice place, kind of a Mayberry kind of place, at least it was, and right on the river. And, um, you know, couldn't have been happier. It wasn't always perfect, but couldn't have been happier. A lot of the people that I grew up with stayed. You know, they didn't, you know, there might have been a curiosity, but um, 
it's safe, you know, to kind of stay within the boundaries. And I found that once you step out of that zone, you can't stop. So it just keeps, you know, you keep wanting more. And design is kind of what we're talking about today. And that was revealed by kind of stepping out of the comfort zone. Well, I, uh, I'm going to go back to the, the, the carry at age four in the cottage near the river and uh, the outhouse. Do you recall the story about the outhouse? Why don't you tell me that story? That was the gallery. Now, you were four years old. Yeah, about four, four or five. Yeah. So early on, you know, if someone threw me a pencil, I could, I would attempt to draw something. And so for a toddler, it was like, well, look what he can do. You know, he can draw something. And so I got a lot of encouragement. And we had this really simple cottage on stilts because it was not far from the river. And the levee was there and it would flood every spring. That's why it was on the stilts. And it had pump, you know, pumped water and propane tank and an outhouse. And I had great grandparents, I had uncles and aunts, and they all flocked around, you know, drinking cheap beer and smoking cigarettes and laughing and playing cards. That was, you know, that was the perfect life. And the outhouse became my gallery. So the family would refer to the gallery. And I remember one time in particular, I think it was about four, my great, I just finished a paint by number, I think, or something. And my great grandmother raised it in front of the family and said, look what he kid, you know, he just finished another masterpiece. I'm going to take it out to the gallery. And it, that was like the Sistine Chapel in that fly bitten, you know, outhouse. And you'd sit there and I was kind of proud. So I think, you know, there, there I am, you know. So this is, you're yeah. under 10, under five. You're yeah. very young and you also Four. made brownies. This is the story. Oh, yeah, did that too. <laughs> so um, uh, the story I shared is my dad, a uh, former Navy guy, was in the Marines, traditional guy from the 60s, uh, you know, wouldn't cook or clean dishes, but he could fix anything. He'd mow the grass. And my mother and father had the perfect marriage. You know, everything kind of worked. She did everything. Well, she, yeah. <laughs> That's the perfect marriage. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess she did everything, but uh, he would never, I mean, a man wouldn't pick up a, you know, a pan to cook or something like that. But for some reason, I liked it. And so when I was five, I wanted an easy bake oven. And that wasn't really brought up in the conversation. That wasn't an option. G.I. Joe's, Tonka trucks, BB gun. But anyway, so... Uh, my grandfather, who liked to dabble in the kitchen, bought the Easy Bake Oven, and so I was really happy with that and made brownies and opened up a little store on the porch and was selling brownies for a nickel, or whatever. So women thought that was fine. I made potholders and brownies. I also played football and baseball and all that. So maybe that creative bent somehow you know, was stirring in there? Well, I think about your uncle and the Mickey Mouse story. Do you recall that? That was a... Was yeah, that the aha moment when you thought? was one of them uh, because I, you know, as a kid, for those of you that, you know, explore graphic design or something like that, for me, and I think it's pretty common, you know, we like to draw or cut or paper or color and... Uh, like cartoons and things like that. And I remember watching um, the Disney, Wonderful Wor World of Disney on Sunday night and, you know, going through the animation, you know, I tried that as a kid, you know, just the flip book thing. So you make a doodle and you make it happen. So I was thinking about all of that. And I had an uncle who was more or less a cousin. He was just older, a lot older than me. And I didn't know he could draw or, you know, but he sat me on his lap and said, you know, how do you draw Mickey Mouse? It's just a bunch of circles. And he slowly went through that and I was amazed. And when you see it happen, that's the aha moment. It's kind of like, you know, you, you can see and appreciate to a point, but when you see someone actually 
expose it. So it's like these circles just became Mickey Mouse and that's how it's done. And so I thought that is what I want to do. And so you, you're kind of, that's the, that's the secret. And all of a sudden I'm on the, you know, the receiving end of that. So that was exciting. Would you say that was your, per, perhaps your most powerful adolescent experience? I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of what caused you to veer away from making brownies well, to... I still like making brownies. <laughs> <don't> like me. <laughs> Except that there's only so many brownies you can eat every week. So how did you then decide that, wow, I can do this, I can actually, and it's not difficult for me? Mm. When did that happen? Probably around that time. I mean, it, You're the under- difficulty... Yeah, I think I thought this is something within my range. So it wasn't hard for me to copy or... And that's how I learned, really, was copying. So I look at things and try to draw them. I like comics, of course, and I would try to... I would all day long be drawing from the comics, trying to... And um, I had a good friend who, you know, is a cartoonist today, so we kind of fed off each other. And... um, watched Saturday morning cartoons, you know, so all of that was, you know, kind of starting to make sense. And, you know, I, I was recognized of I could do it. It wasn't that hard and I liked it. So I think that became part of the, maybe this will lead to a career or I get paid for it or something. So from that era, then we go through several many experiences, ending up at the University of Illinois and uh, the Daily Illini. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you do cartoons there. Mm-hmm. I could make money at it. So, um, you know, step before Illinois, I, you know, I thought maybe I would be a cartoonist and I worked for the high school paper and I would do comics and editorial cartoons. I liked the idea of editorial cartoons because it was a point of view that you could have influence. So you took, you know, a comedic slant on it maybe, but you could actually impact, you know, a reader or a perception about an idea which often was political or something like that. And I I liked that side. So I thought, well, maybe I'll be an editorial cartoonist. I didn't necessarily want to be a everyday comic strip guy. And so when I went to Illinois, I, I needed to, to work, and I applied for the paper there, the Daily Line I, as the graphics editor. And I was, you know, just beginning graphic design. And editorial cartoons were part of that. So I did the cartoons for the paper, and I could kind of pay myself whatever I thought it was worth. It's a pretty good deal. So I thought if I were the graphics editor, I also pay the cartoonist who is me. And so I could kind of like decide if I need the money, I would just do more illustrations and editorial cartoons. And I really thought that could be the way for me. So there was a guy named Jeff McNelly who was an editorial cartoonist with the Tribune who I thought was brilliant. He had a comic strip called Shoe, if you if anyone ever remembered Shu, But I thought McNally was great. So McNally, you know, cartoonist that sat on the editorial board of the paper. So he's the only cartoonist of all the editors who are journalists. And and I like that. So I like not being surrounded by cartoonists and people like me. Or I wanted to be part of a broader, more diverse um you know, backgrounds, people, interests, and adding some component to that. And that's why I think graphic design is the perfect fit for me. And why not pursue that um, as, for example, Mr. Schultz with uh, Peanuts and uh, Charlie Brown. And uh, if you had done that, perhaps you would own this building. There, There's that possibility. But... Um, Lightning strikes, you know. But Schultz you, was my, he was my, he was the icon. So, you know, my wife knows the story that when I was nine, I was all about Snoopy and Peanuts. 
and I had a Snoopy stuffed animal and I had, you know, Snoopy or Peanuts books. I watched the shows, of course, were, and I found Charles Schultz address somehow. And he lived in Minnesota and I wrote him and I said, I'm like your greatest fan. I'm nine years old. I want to be you. Could you draw a picture of Snoopy for me? And he did. So he wrote back and said, like, you know, Carrie, keep it. So this was not another, this was big. So it's like, I'm so glad you appreciate it. You can do this. And here's the Snoopy you wanted. And I thought, oh, my God. And I still have it. So I wrote him right away and said, how about a picture of, of Linus? <laughs> and so he sent a picture of the whole gang because I thought, and it was, I think it's a, I don't think it's an original. It kind of looks... But I thought, he thought, this kid will not go away. <laughs> so it's like, how about a Lucy? How about a, you know, so he, he just sent it, you know, the whole thing and said, good luck. <laughs> you know, you know, there it is, the whole thing. So this but I, is, I thought he was the best because his demeanor, too, was appealing to me. He's a, a quiet guy in Minnesota, had his own, you know, story, his own issues, he had a great sense of humor, as you know, his... Charlie Brown is who he is. So that's all the things that he dealt with as a kid. So that's, you know, the autobiographical part. So I, I thought that he was the kind of, you know, kind of emulated what I wanted to do. I, I think the uh, the authors of fic works of fiction, my view of those are always autobiographical. You can only write fiction about experiences that you've enjoyed. It seems to me that Schultz, everything that he's done is about him, his experiences. Do you find that to be the case with the the symbols that you create? I mean, is it is it about you, or is it constrained by the individual who has engaged you to perform the activity? Well, I I thought about that, and you know, I definitely the you know I you know my opinion is style. I have a style. I, I like, you know, I've used the example. I, I don't particularly like Art Deco personally, but I've seen beautiful Art Deco design. And it's perfect for, you know, the, the right occasion and beautiful Art Deco buildings. So personal preferences and styles, um, you know, we all have that. And I try to be objective in what I do because I am reflecting a client's point of view or interest. But in terms of autobiographical, I was thinking, well, I do like neat. And a lot of people will comment like, well, we like your design. It's so clean. And I'm thinking that's a very common way to describe the kind of design I do, which isn't, you know, mine uniquely, but it's clean. And what does that mean? It's orderly. It's, you know, has a certain function, timelessness about it. And I think, okay, autobiographical, my dad was very neat. My mother was very neat. You know, there was a sense of order within the chaos, too, you know. But I thought, well, maybe I'm not comfortable within that. So if things are in order and there's some reason behind it and it has a timeless quality, but I'm drawn to that. So I think that maybe that's, you know. So in your world, less is more. Yeah. And, you know, the other side is less as a bore, and I get that too. Um, but uh, I'm totally comfortable in that environment. But the extravagant, you know, side too, and you know, my daughter, me and I went to an Elton John concert not too long ago, and which was kind of cool because I, I, I grew up with Elton John. <laughs> but um, the last song he did was something new. He's 74 years old. He said, this is number one. Who's the artist again? Yeah, yeah. And so this came, this psychedelic flowers, and, and I mean, it, it is so cool. And I thought, that is not less is more. And it's super, I mean, the energy, the beauty of all that. So I, I, I work well within the... But Carrie, Carrie, how do you handle it? The psychedelic. It sounds to me that less is more pure, like the Swiss approach, very narrow, very, very uh, understated, if you will. And yet, how do you handle the psychedelic environment? All these noises, the colors. Do you, are you comfortable in a crowd? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> depends on the crowd, actually. No, but in depends other words, will you go to a Bears game or White Sox or whatever, and are you comfortable in that environment, and yet your comfort zone sounds like you're most comfortable alone mm -hmm. in front of a board. Is that, am I upside down? Is this sounds like Oh, it's, it's all true, I think. How it's do you all... change from the <clears throat> extrovert to the introvert? Well, that's, that's the story, you know, so I, um, that curiosity again, you know, I don't, the reason I went to the University of Illinois was I was thinking I'm going to go to design school, I'm going to, you know, study design. So I looked at the art, uh, uh, the Muse uh, Minneapolis Art Institute, Kansas City Art Institute, and there was another art school in Illinois. And I thought, I'm going to go to the University of Illinois. Why? Because it's the university, and I'm going to be studying different, you know, subjects and be around different people. I'm going to go to the football game, because I liked, liked all that, that too, too. Uh, and, and basketball, basketball and concerts and all that stuff. So I, you know, I, I'm not... Um, Come for one dimensional. I don't think you know one answer is you know is a solid answer. You can question you know any finite like you know you never you always I think well you don't. But there are certain common sensical you know guidelines to what we do and what makes sense and what works and what doesn't. Well, I, I have a sense that. The, what you're doing is very logical, these guidelines. They, the, the information I've gleaned about your academic background is such that there are certain principles, design principles, that you adhere to, which sounds like it's a little strange in the sense that yet you, you are creative, but you're within the confines created by these ancestors. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, I like the universal... I mean, it's, it's like, like history. history. So, that, you know, if, you, if you're a student and you're, why do I need to take history? You know, what, how am I going to make money on that? How's that? I think, well, because there's a continuum. You, you, I mean, some things are re repeatable and um, some things you don't want to repeat. And I think design, you know, we're the, the beneficiaries of a lot of very intelligent people who kind of look at, you know, there are functional reasons. You're, if you're a designer, you know, you have to have some appreciation for the function. And so I, you know, from a design point of view, you can look at work and think, oh, that is terrific. I want to do that, you know, my entire life and find out later it didn't function at all. It was a total failure. So, you know, I, I appreciate that part. It has to have some purpose or reason to be you know, appreciate it or, or be successful. For you feel good about it, if you will. I'd, I'd like to turn, turn to the question of making money. This is all very, very good at that. <laughs> not very, uh, very few people are, it seems to me, in today's environment especially. I'd, I'd like to address uh, your first experience with the minimum wage. You recall you were at the U of I, and <clears throat> one of your professors said, listen, this group here, this architectural group, is looking to design a, a logo for a hospital. Do you remember that? It was a sign system. Sign system. A $4 million yeah. sign system. And now the question is negotiating your hourly rate. Tell me about that. Well, I didn't have a clue to what I was doing, which also <laughs> is not unusual. But there's a confidence. So, you know, it's, it's terrifying at first when you know you don't know what you're doing, but someone puts you out there anyway, and they have confidence in you, and... They think, well, you know, you could do it. So in that case, I think I was just starting gradu graduate school. I was pretty tight with a professor. And um, he was a consultant for an architect and did various things. Small, I think, one-off one signs for the most part, restaurants and other kinds of things. And they were going to build a hospital. I think it was a four-story hospital in Urbana. I was 19, 20 years old, I think. And he said, you know, they need someone to do this sign system. I don't want to do it. You know, I, I just don't want to do it. It's too hard or too, you know. So I think you could do it. I'm thinking, okay. And so he made, he kind of set me up, said, you know, I already recommended, you know, you to the owner. And so there you go. And so I met with the owner and he said, you're coming highly recommended. 
So this is where like you, it depends on the connection sometimes. Like, do you want to see my portfolio? It's like, no, you don't. No, no, don't speak. His word is good. He says you're the best. So here's the deal. You know, I'm going to, you know, it's an hourly thing and you're going to design the system for the hospital. And so my professor said, here's what you should do. I charge $40 an hour. This was like in 1981. $40 an hour. So I'm making, I don't know, seven fifty, ten, dollars something like that, doing a cartoon thing. So he said, well, I charge 40 and I'm a professional. So, so I think since you're still a student, you should charge slightly less than half, which would be like seventeen fifty. And so I thought, that's a lot. So I thought, I'm okay. So he said, so here, I'm thinking, so I'm, it's like slow motion, here it comes. And he said, 750 an hour. And I was appalled, offended. I thought, are you kidding? Because I knew what he was paying. And then I'm listening, like talk, you know, talk, think through this, think through, because he's giving me an opportunity to do something that will surely pay dividends later. And so I said, okay, because I'm not losing anything. And I said, I'll do the job. And so I thought I'm getting paid seven fifty to be an assistant to an architect. I don't know anything about architecture, really. I took a drafting class in junior high. I didn't know how to use an architectural measure, but I knew how to like use a T-square. So the first day, they said, well, there's your desk, and good luck with that. And I'm thinking, well, who am I working with? He said, well, no, you're, you're doing this. So I quickly, instead of saying, look, I quit or, you know, I'm totally out of my league here, I just started asking myself, quite what do you need to know? So I called up a sign company and said, you know, what, how would you, what should I be thinking? I was like, well, you could do this or that. And then I did tours of the hospital and, Started, you know, just thinking through. And this is a four million dollar sign system. Yeah, I thought, are you crazy? And you're getting seven fifty an hour, and he's probably billing you out at a hundred and fifty. Yeah, whatever. and and this is the story. So this is your first experience with capitalism. Yes. Now your second experience, perhaps Continental Can. Tell me about that. Oh well, that was yeah, that was Container Corporation. Oh, Container yeah. Corporation of America. Well, that wasn't so much a. a a money thing, but um, but you were you were on W two. You, you were being compensated for your work and probably some benefits and the like. So this was your first adventure into uh, the real world. So we're now moving in your resume. I got the biggest kick. It's in the product that uh, is on the screen. Your resume was with yellow, just a uh, yellow background or foreground. Tell me about the resume. You did the resume. Well, yeah. So it's the only resume I've ever done. Yeah, I mean, one resume yeah. all your life. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about it. Well, so it was, it was typography. One, you know, so I, I knew who I was going to be meeting with, so I knew their work. So I thought, well, they'll you know design it accordingly. Now wait, let me back up. What does the business do? What did Continental do? Well, Container Corporation. Container Corporation. I'm sorry. Manufactured boxes. But I mean, all sorts of boxes. What would a graphic artist do at, at that company? Well, that was, uh, and I know some people here are familiar with the history, but Container Corporation of America was an incredible story um, that had a design legacy that was formidable, was historic. Oh, and I said, but what did they actually produce? Paperboard. So you're the, the artist, the graphic designer, coming into this organization to design paperboard? No, we did the promotions for the companies. So I was a brand and marketing design group for the, comp the corporation. Once in a while, we would move into a client space. But we were, uh, it was an established uh, design program that was you know, the best. And... They created the image for the company, which was a global company. Okay, so part of this was branding. It wasn't called that then. But that's what it's called now. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, though. Identifying an organization with, like, Coke or whatever. So now you're in that solution. First day, what happens? 
You mean the cab thing, or I no, no, you're there. All of a sudden, you go from the U of I, oh. I guess, yeah, and all of a sudden you're in the real world, and yeah. Well, that first day actually, so I couldn't believe I I got the job. That was what I wanted most of all, and so I took the train in to the Loop in Chicago, and I was afraid to be late, so I jumped in a cab and. Then, Gave him the address, and he said, where are you going? I said, 33 West Monroe, please. And he's like, are you sure? And I'm thinking, yes, please. I mean, I, and it was like two blocks. <laughs> so I got in the cab, and he dropped me off and said, there you are. I'm thinking, yeah. didn't want to be late. But the whole experience, you know, I'm so there's one of those, like, you came from, it's like the outhouse to the White House. <laughs> so the, it was a beautiful new building with white marble lobby and an escalator and the curbs were high, granite entrance, and I thought, you did it. This is just like Muscatine, Iowa. Pretty just much. exactly Pretty like much. it. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, it's, I don't get too worked up about it because I thought you did it, but I thought, you're still the kid that's got the gallery. Your you age know, was what? 22, I think. 20, so here, downtown 22. Chicago. Admits uh, uh, in, in the middle of the world, if you will, the commercial world. And, and so you now your first day, what happened? Well, um, you know, I got assigned my desk in the cubicle. And the good thing is that the guy I worked for uh, went to Drake in Iowa. He, you know, he was from Missouri originally. So we connected in that way. And that's what I find is that even the, the, the Biggest successes, the biggest names, the most uh, accomplished designers were not that different. You know, we come from similar backgrounds and families and places. And so the first day was uh, very comfortable because they made it so. They, I felt welcomed and ready to go. And I thought, again, okay, so you'll give me a simple project and I'll do the paste up or the production. And I think the first project was a series of posters. And again, I thought, you're out of your mind. Why would you possibly think to do that? And I was told uh, by John Massey, he's like, Grady, there's a reason why we hired you. And I thought, you know, stand up, you know, get it done. And, you know, nobody, and this is what I tell my staff is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to sometimes throw you into the fire but I'll never let you burn. And I am okay with that because people that, you know, they, they'll put me in positions where maybe they know I'm not exactly familiar with it, but I won't steer you wrong. I mean, it, you kind of like, so that's a, you know, that's a, just a respect for, you know, who you're working with. And so it worked you know, out. You had these projects. It worked out pretty well. And they were for, you were there several years? Yeah, I think four, maybe five. And now Mobile Oil bought the company. Well, and actually, Mobile owned them already. I see. And I thought, you know, the greatest, you know, design program and, you know, what a great company. But the, you, you start to um, hear the whispers behind the, in, in the doors, and the company wasn't doing that well financially. Mobile owned them, and we were a very small part of their bigger global portfolio. And... So I thought, I don't think this is going to go on forever. And so that's the other side is a big corporation. You start to realize, you know, what's the reality. And, of course, the 80s were very uh, volatile in the big, you know, picture. And, you know, you trust your senses about things. So that's always worked out. So you left. I left. Yeah. And you're into, uh, if I can summarize it in a word, branding. I'd like to understand, what is branding about? Well, I mean, that, that's what you do. You do a lot of things, yeah. but if you describe what you do in a word, it could be branding. Yeah, well, and, and branding is a lot of things. I mean, I guess I would take that side of it. Is, you know, I, I thought I would always be a designer, and we design things. And, um, you know, designers are, you know, we incorporate a lot of, other moving parts, and we're kind of the, the directors of those parts. And but branding is voice, it's visual, you know, which 
design is primarily visual, but uh, branding is all about, you know, it's a bigger picture. It's, it's the feel and the expression of a company or a product and design is part of that. So it gets multi-layered. It's, it's uh, you know, lots of touch points and you hear all these other things. So, you know, I'm involved in that for sure. And I like the, you know, the ask, I like being part of strategy. I like talking about words and the voice and the feel. And, you know, I like that, which goes all the way back to, I like playing football. I like making brownies or eating brownies. So, I, uh, <clears throat> we've alluded to this a little bit. I, I view advertising and branding and symbols a form of poetry. You know, there's, good poetry has multiple layers. T.S. Eliot, uh, the, the Wasteland, whatever. There's, there's three, four, the, the, the greater the number of hidden meanings, the better the poetry. It seems to me there's something about advertising uh, that, you know, the Marvel man uh, <laughs> uh, they, owning this Buick that goes 170 miles an hour, you're going to change, you're going to be the most wonderful person of the world if you eat uh, McDonald's hamburgers and this sort of thing. So there is a bit of poetry. Is, is that fair to say in, in your experience with advertising? Multiple levels? Well, for sure there's multiple levels. I, and when, when I think of poetry and design, I think there's a, a synergy there. And what I was thinking about was I, I knew a guy named Rhodes Patterson, and I referred to him in the, in the book. Uh, Rhodes was a Renaissance man I came in a container and he was like my uncle, kind of took me in and he had a, a literature degree from the University of Georgia, I believe. He was a photographer, a designer, and he, and he's, he was a, a romantic, you know, kind of uh, with words and, and vision. And um, one of his expressions that he shared with me in design was pace, like in book design, it's pace and grace. It's as you unfold the pages, the design, you know, has a rhythm to it. And, and I always remember that. So when I think of design and poetry, poetry has a rhythm, you know, it changes. A page or a poster, you know, has potentially a rhythm. Certainly books or a sequence or a film has a rhythm. And I think there's, that's where the, connection is to it and also it it can create a connection so you know through poetry you you know create a picture or a connection i think design can do that as well i'm thinking about um, not only you are a bit of an artist i'll call that um, understanding the application of poetry but also you're an author this book took you uh, four years to write is it yeah that's kind of sad isn't it <laughs> No, I'm told that oftentimes books, good ones, will sometimes take five years. So when I saw this was only four years, my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> overachiever. <laughs> you really, you really be able to do something. But um, so I'd like to understand your views of the correspondence or the relationship among um, poetry, the book, and design, do you see some corollaries that, that apply to all three, the reading, writing, arithmetic, and sort of thing? All the same or all different, or how do you feel about that? Well, I think especially in, well, in that kind of a book, um, yeah, the writing almost killed me because it's really, I like writing. I, I think I have a, an appreciation of it. It's, it's uh, to get the right word, to, to get the Oh, wait word. a minute, wait a minute here. So you're saying the writing was very difficult, but the creation of these symbols, multifaceted, was easy. Yet you did both. Well, remember, 40 years of, of visuals <laughs> in there, so it took a while. No, I, but I, I find that the design is easier for me. I see things that I can... Why? Why? I, I don't know that exactly. I think about the precision. The design is precise. When you're done, you're done. But a book has a life of its own. And yeah. your use of words may not be the same as the, the reader perceives a whole different... Putting it another way, 
uh, writing is finite, uh, is infinite, versus the design is finite. You see the product and you're done. You thought about that? Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. And I don't, uh, you know, in my view of what I do, you know, the design, the book, whatever, it's, it's for a time. This is I'm not changing the world. And, you know, everything has a, a time. So what might be, you know, a symbol that we all recognize is it's totally irrelevant at some point. It, you know, it, uh, it's archived, it's part of history, it's part of a continuum. And um, it's not that big of a deal. Not that big of a deal. The creation of something that, that is a big deal. I'm thinking Dunkin' Donuts. Something as simple as it used to be Mr. Donut, then we had Dunkin' Donuts, and all of a sudden we have now Dunkin'. And the image, I mean, you think you want a donut, you th oh man, I've got to go to Dunkin'. I, I get the coffee all of a sudden. So I, I differ with you. You create value in the quantitative sense as well as the qualitative sense. Have you thought of that? You're making money by the use of that symbol. Yeah. Well, um, there is all of that, but uh, I mean, so, so for the permanence, you know, of, of anything that that I've done with it, it's, I, you know, that's not the driver. But the the language, I you know, I overwrite, you know, so it's like I someone like me needs a good editor. The design, I kind of get. I, I think I can self-edit design and know when it's enough you know, when it's right and move on. And, you know, the part of this story is, you know, I'm trying to demonstrate that the first thing and the last thing, which is a chron chronology of the work over 40 years, is solid. So my, my hope is you could open the book and look at any page and say, that's pretty good. Because I witnessed and I learned from, you know, some really great designers who I saw as the careers waned you know, it's kind of like not their best work. And I mentioned this in the book. It's like taking your son to a all-star baseball game and seeing, you know, Willie Mays drop the ball and saying he was really good. You know, back, you know, if you could just go back there. He shouldn't be playing anymore, but, boy, he was good. And yeah, when to quit. Yeah. <laughs> when to quit. Well, and also finish strong. And that's my message is, you know, to myself is finish strong. And, you know, don't wait, you know, don't linger on your past success. Don't, you know, bring up, of course, there's repeat, you know, it's like, oh, I've done this before. I kind of, you know, it can be more efficient because I've, I've been experiencing this, but I, I just don't want to go out that way. And this whole thing started when I, the first thing in the book is a, a record album jacket that I designed when I was still in school. It was for a jazz band. And I did it all by hand. It's like a Swiss, you know, lines. And, and I found it in the office a few years ago. And I brought it out and I showed the team. I said, look, look at this. And they, they, someone said, what is it? And I said, it's an album jacket. And someone else said, what is that? <laughs> and I said, like vinyl? And they said, oh, I said, they put vinyl in this. And they're like, oh, oh. I said, well, what do you think of the design? I said, well, it's, it's cool. I thought, yeah, I did so by hand. So I, I thought, what else do I have? And, and so looking at that, I thought, how do I, feel like, uh, how do I feel about the design 40 years later? And I thought, I think it's pretty solid. So, what, you know, so I thought that's what I'm trying to, to go for. And as the applications change, so you go from what we all thought we were going to be doing was the romance of, Applied art, we'd be doing things that are printed and things that are, you know, filmed and not in the digital space, which is even more temporal. You know, it's nothing lasts, it's all very immediate. And it's, it's frustrating because you can't control it as well. But the design should still be know, true. Yeah, be true. Uh, Carrie, um, let's forget about the esoteric for a second. Talk about making money. How, how do you make money in, in this area now with Apple and <clears throat> these other uh, opportunities, uh, schemes, programs, 
that can manipulate and, and design, and not in the sense you're doing it, I think, but you can create something that appears to be a design. And, and yet, you need not be licensed to do what you're doing. You need not have a PhD. Uh, my dog, Jack, who could press some buttons, perhaps. <laughs> He's very talented, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm understating. I, 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 but the point is, how do you convert this qualitative design, this emotional, this drive, to something that goes in your pocket, the quantitative part of it. Well, it's, a lot has changed. And someone asked me a few years ago, like, would you start a design studio today or boutique agency, whatever you want to call it? And I had to pause. I thought, I don't know. The chances of survival are to, be, to make money are not good. So, um, and the reason why I'm still in the game is because of reputation and experience and connection and portfolio of work and it gives you some, you know, to a serious client, it would say, well, you gotta go with someone that has some expertise or knowledge. But, uh, so everything has changed, it's all inside out because when I started, things hadn't changed in 100 years or so, when you, you couldn't print or design something on your own, you had to go to a professional, you had to go to a designer you had to go to a design agency, a, a studio, and they would design it for you, and a book or a poster, or it doesn't matter what it is, a logo, a standards, or whatever it is. You need an expert. And so we were experts. So we, we learned the, the methodology, the approach, the skills, the technology, printing, photography. And then the digital world, you know, gradually, pretty rapidly actually, changed all of that. So you're right, to be a, a graphic designer or whatever you want to call that takes zero education, takes zero... Um, Just enormous skill. That's all it takes. Yeah, and even the skill level is varied because if you learn the tool, you learn the, the app, which you know kids can do in their bedroom, and you can do it in Bangladesh, and you can do it in... Yes, but yes, but Karen, I think you're understanding, understanding this. It seems to me that the successful uh, business looks for someone that understands that person's business and addresses the concerns and the fears, perhaps expectation, but concerns and fears. And you should be able to bring that to the table that my dog Jack or the kid can't bring. And how do you get... That business person, the guy that's going to, or gal's going to write the check, to understand the the qualitative aspects of what you're doing. Well, and I think part of it, and it goes full circle. So, it's it's honest, um, clear, sincere, you know, communication too. Because I don't oversell. You know, it's a, you know, undersell and over deliver. I mean, these are all Midwestern, you know things we, we should live by. And the, the work, I think, speaks for itself. The reputation, you know, is there. So usually, and I have a certain, kind of known for a certain kind of work now, so we have that conversation about confidence. When you're a business, you do want to know, you're not looking for someone just to make a, an image. It is a, a, a broader kind of design is, a big part of it, but branding and strategy is becoming more of the lead. I used, I've, I've said that 20 years ago, people would come for the design. So it's like, we saw what you designed for them. Can you design something like that for us? And they can't do it. Now they come and say, you understand our business. You know, you're, you have a good reputation. What's your process and all of that? And you're hired. And what I usually add is, oh, by the way, we're really good designers, so you're going to like the end product. And they think, oh, well, that's a bonus. And it used to be the lead is design something for us. Well, you don't know the business, but we can work around that. Yeah, um, one of the issues that, that I see that you may face, and correct me, is uh, bigness. In other words, uh, using a caterpillar, a local organization. 
um, perhaps to insulate the individual who's engaging the outside uh, representative. You, you gotta be big. You got you gotta be a X Y Z, uh, almost a New York Stock Exchange design company. And the risk of engaging carry is very substantial. So how do you overcome that built in? I don't want to make a mistake, and I've got to surround myself with the greatest accounting firm, the greatest law firm. They're going to overcharge, but uh, nonetheless, if something gets messed up, it's not my fault. How do you overcome that prejudice? Well, I haven't actually. So <laughs> there's a you you see, I'm going to just talk about logos or brands. You know, I this is nothing new, but you know, you look around and you think. I could have done better. You see a logo for a big company and you say, well, who did that? Well, it's the same names that pop up. Why? Because the other big company used them. So, you know, that's safe. If, you know, if you're as old as I am, you know, the old IBM antage is, you know, you can't go wrong with calling IBM. That goes back to the 60s, 70s, 80s. So what's the risk in that? If you want to go with Apple or some other startup or, or rogue you know, business, you know, you're taking a risk. So f for me, you know, I'm, uh, most of my, my favorite clients are small, mid-sized companies that I can have a relationship with. I didn't really like working with the big companies. But you have. You have. have. And, and internationally, not just uh, Peoria, Illinois, yeah. Galesburg. We're talking about Germany, the U.K., uh, I worked some of the other countries that you've worked around. Well, we talked about Portugal, remember that? One? Yes. So I worked with a, a court company in Portugal. And these are, I mean, when you say global, so... No, wait a minute. It's not, it's not like you're hokey finoki down the street here. And, and yet you it's have a great brand name. <laughs> okay, but, okay. Yeah. I had a cousin named Hokey, you yeah. know, but, but the point is uh, that you've got to kind of know what you're doing. You have to have created something that people, ah, I'd like something like that. Right. And yet the, you want to be around the decision makers. So the caterpillars of the world are great, but thank you. Yeah. Well, and a lot, and you know, to sometimes when you're not known and you have to uh, qualify that you're up to speed, you name drop. So they say, well, who are the companies you worked for? And you name drop and, you know. It's Sarah like, Lee. Uh, well, the funny part of it is, or maybe not so, is all those names are long gone. So they say, well, who have you worked yeah. for that we might <laughs> think? I think Spiegel? Montgomery Ward? Sears? Sarah Lee. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sarah Lee. And they're like, hmm, anyone that's still around. <laughs> like, no, not so much. But, but that's the, uh, you know, again, that's the, I'm happy to say I've been around that long when everything that I did that ever really mattered is kind of, you know, it's like, well, there was a time, or Container Corporation, remember them? It's like, no, was that that company back then? Like, yeah, that was a big deal yeah. back then. Well, I, I, I understand the, the issues that you face, but I'd like to go back and talk about what goes on in, in, in the head of Kerry Grady. I mean, you're, you're, you, when you drove down here, you saw some billboards. You, you saw some uh, designs. Uh, can you, how, how do you handle driving along and seeing these billboards that you think are terrible? I mean, I, do, you, do you just black them out? You just say, oh, well, next. Nope. Um, so again, you know, it's very, I'm very comfortable in ultra refined design environments and I, I get it. You know, you can be in the, the art gallery or whatever. I, I get that. Going home to Iowa and I might have shared this story at one point, but um, some years ago, you know, as I'm wearing the black mock turtleneck, it's like my favorite go-to. And I was driving back to Iowa in a German car convertible and I was wearing a black t-shirt or something. They don't know I'm from there, right? And there was a car that rolled down the window and they're like, hey, hey, he's here driving by. And I'm thinking, what's the big deal? But it was like, you don't see that in Muscatine. So I pulled in the line, I'm thinking, oh boy, because I don't like, I don't want to be, you know, the center of attention. I went in the grocery store, came out, there was a farmer looking at the car. 
he was a bib overalls. He said, is that a German car? And I said, it is. And he said, how are they? And I said, they're very nice. He said, that's what I heard. And I went to my mom's house, changed the clothes, drove her car around. I mean, it's like totally fine in that environment. So it's not, um, you know, like everything is perfect and refined. And when I was in, when I was studying school at Illinois, I remember stopping along the road and looking at a billboard and I was distraught because the spacing between the letters was not good. Oh, wait a minute now. So, so you're driving along and you see the, the spacing of the letters was inappropriate. It was wrong. It was wrong. So I thought, does no one understand <laughs> typography? Well, how, how do you get to that? How mm. do, I, I, with whom do you visit? I mean, who no can, one. Who can you who talk to? Who would want to talk to someone like that? <laughs> yeah, about, about spacing and letters. So I thought, don't, I mean, you, don't go down that path. And um, I might have mentioned in the book, I can't remember, but I uh, knew a designer. He was uh, uh, quite established at the time, Illinois grad. And he told me, he said, Swiss design. So we talk a lot about Swiss design. That's it. And he thought paradise would be living in Switzerland and in Basel and everything would be perfect. And it is. And after two weeks, he said, get me back to New York. <laughs> because when everything is perfect and uniform and it's very disturbing, you need contrast, you need chaos, you need to understand the, you know, the, when things are different. So I don't mind, you know, I'm very comfortable in the cheap cottage. I'm very comfortable in the Taj Mahal. I've never been to Taj Mahal. So someone else is in there, I think. But anyway, um, so I like, you know, all of that. And I don't need it to be, I mean, when I see the billboards, I'm totally fine. I'm, I'm surprised how many attorneys have billboards. Yeah, that's a different issue. <laughs> uh, They're all kind of the same. Well, I, we could spend the rest of the afternoon or evening on that. And, but it seems to me, if you have to advertise, you can't be very good. Hmm. You ever thought of that? There's something to that. You don't advertise. Not very well. No, but you, you have a website, and you're not on billboards. Mm -mm. You're not advertising. Mm -mm. Can't afford it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so in, no. in response yeah. to this question of, of lawyers advertising, of uh, investment advisors advertising, my theory has always been your light shines brightest under a bushel basket. Mm -hmm. And so if you're advertised, that means you really aren't that very good. So the Cary Grady's of the world have achieved this enormous success. I'll call it qualitative success because money isn't, isn't your goal in life, it seems to me. But it's to create something that, that you think well of yourself. You begin to respect Cary Grady. Isn't that what this is all about? I think that's what it's all about, yeah. Carrie, is there anything I haven't talked about that you think I should have visited with you about? Well, there's a lot you haven't talked about. I don't know if you should. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, I mean, where do you go from here kind of thing? You know, so the business of, of what I do, you know, is it's been a hard road the last, I mean, it was, it was the golden age, you know, for so long. And when I entered design, it was the golden age. I couldn't have been happier doing, and I was good at it and doing all the things I wanted to do and, and uh, it, you know, photography and printing and, and that's pretty much gone. And, um, and to make money in the business when you're trying to explain that, yes, you know, you can buy a logo for a hundred dollars or you could hire us and by the way, we used to charge this and now we charge that because we have efficiencies and things. But it's, it, it's tiring at times. It's kind of like, why do I have to keep, you know, having this conversation? Isn't it obvious by now? But that's the dynamics of any space. And I might have shared with you, the only other entrepreneur in my family was my grandfather started a dry cleaning business out of when he came out of World War II. And um, I, he... Uh, passed in the, a fairly young age. 
but his business, you know, took off and then it, it, it fell off pretty rapidly. And I asked, you know, my, my mother, what happened? And she said in 1957, I think 56, they invented polyester. And I thought, oh, you don't have to take your clothes to the dry cleaner to be pressed. You know, well, Carrie, I, I, I think I understand what you're suggesting, but it seems to me that you can, you have succeeded, you will continue to succeed by identifying that individual that addresses the engagement, that understands what you're about. That's the person you've got to find. And you probably can recognize that in the first five minutes of the interview. Is that fair? Yeah. If this person doesn't get it, I'm yeah. wasting my time. So go ahead and use some stencils. Yeah, I, I yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> get some green stamps or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so <laughs> there's got to be people out there because those people create value, make things happen. They're different. Apple, for mm -hmm. example, New Newton's Apple, the swoosh, uh, Nike. Mm -hmm. There are still those people in the world. Is that fair? How do you find them, though? Well, they're, uh, they're, uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, Apple. That's a whole other thing. But there, you know, like I said earlier, I think there's a lot of common ground, uh, and and I find, and you kind of started this conversation in a similar way that. When you meet someone, you just say, well, so what's your story? And I like to look at their bio, and I'm not looking at, I'm looking at for that, like, where'd they go to school? Or what, where are they from? And you could pretty like, oh, I know, you know, I, I went there, or I know there. Or, Did you, are you a fan of something? And then you have a instant connection. You, we're not talking, we're not doing an interview. We're having a conversation like, oh, yeah, tell me more about that. And then it's like, well, now that we have that trust, kind of like, beginning relationship now let's talk about the assignment what do we what, you know and I'll tell you if I can add value or not and you know certainly and I, I put out there and the way I look at it is like this was a good first date good conversation and I'm certainly interested in working with you if you're interested in working with me let's continue the conversation we don't have to go through an RFP we don't have to go through this whole um, process if you want to work with somebody or or you want someone to work for you, you can have a conversation pretty quickly about do we have do we have a shared interest in continuing the conversation? Yeah, I always uh, when I look at a resume, I don't necessarily look at what's there. I, I usually ask the person what's not there, mm. and you get a whole different answer because. They, that suggests what that person may really be about, what is not there. Anyway, uh, I've enjoyed this opportunity of visiting with you, and, and I've learned more about not only you, but this whole segment, this whole intersection of, of the arts, uh, poetry, advertising, and the like. And, and uh, I look forward to visiting with you more than a few times in the future. And thanks for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Or suggestions? Or so, suggestions. <laughs> Other than shut up. <laughs> no. Any questions, observations? Yes. Well, I uh, the books. First of all, was Schultz, and I'd visited with Carrie about that, and the other was Dr. Seuss, and that was a question of why you could be made a lot more money if you did that sort of thing. And then my favorite happens to be uh, Language in Thought and Action by Harakawa that emphasizes the relationship of advertising and poetry. So I have talked about them, but I haven't alluded to them directly. Next question. Who are your mentors? Mine? Mm -hmm. Well, I know you pretty well. I mean, <laughs> I can't believe you're here, but thank you. Um, on the design side, well, you, you can pretty much know, I think, what I'm going to say. But uh, there was a, well, these, these are graphic designer names. A lot of them were Swiss. So um, uh, Joseph Mueller Brockman, um, Armin Hoffman, or standalones on the Swiss side, uh, both, um, and we were talking about this earlier, what uh, they were 
gentle spirits, you know, firm in their conviction to good design, what design is, very humble in their reputations, and they weren't boastful or they didn't advertise. Um, I, I'm, I didn't meet Armin Hoffman, but I put together a show. I mean, he, he put together the show, but it was a poster show. He couldn't make the show because he had a fear of flying. Uh, but um, his work was, you know, changed a lot in, in the way I, how I think about design. It's really how he thought about design. Joseph Mueller Brockman, I met coincidentally at a, an event when we both stepped out from the main uh, speaker and found ourselves together in a small kind of gallery space. And I read his books and he was the guy that created the grid system and all of this, and again, very, you know, tweed jacket, very quiet demeanor, and asked me if I wanted to sit and talk and have a drink, and he told me his whole story, and which was amazing. Um, a guy named Paul Rand, who was an American, the godfather, grandfather of modern graphic design in America. I met him a couple of times, um, and he was this um, playful, ornery, uh, very bright, very unforgiving, <laughs> intolerant um, in some ways and very loving in another. And his stories and his work spoke for itself. And so very powerful a container. It was John Massey, um, who was iconic and again, a gentleman from Illinois, uh, quiet, modest, his reputation uh, was um, Kerry, these they, are all very modest people, very humble people. Yes, yes. That you can be a, a five-star whatever, but if you're quiet about it, uh, that seems to be the common denominator. What I like that about uh, them and about people in general is that they're kind of a secret. Like, by the way, you look around the room, that's the guy you, you want to know. And I love that. So, I mean, in any environment, or she has quite a story. So... You might think you're in the League of Nations here, but it's that person that really, you know, owns the show. So, I mean, a lot of, you know, they, they were mentors in design and, and um, you know, I think it's, you know, that point in time when, you know, you're, you're very open to... You're the, the sponge. Thing. You're the sponge, yeah. Next question. Any other questions? That was an advertising campaign that started in the 50s. Well, let, let's repeat that question. I'm not sure everyone heard that. There was a series of posters, and I believe they were done by the Container Corporation of America, because I was in Chicago, and there was an exhibit of these posters on the ground level of one of the high-rises, and I was in advertising, and I still have two of those posters. I covered them with like... <laughs> yes. do, you, do you want to restate that a little bit? Well, um, she, uh, Container Corporation of America had an advertising campaign called The Great Ideas of Western Man. It started in the late 50s. Um, it, uh, there's a guy named Ralph Eckerstrom, and um, that was right, right, Ralph? And uh, Herbert Beyer, who was from the Bauhaus in Germany, came to Chicago. The owner of Container, Walter Pepke hired Bayer as a consultant through the influence of his wife. And Ralph Eckerstrom was a marketing design guy. And they started this camp, this series of ads. So remember that it's a box company, but the ads had nothing to do with boxes. So they, they would take a quote of, of a scientist, a historian, a politician, some person of influence, and commission an artist to create whatever they wanted, and that would be the visual of the ad. And they engage artists like Chagall and Monet to create art for advertising, which they would never do before. Well, why, why, what, what's the money? Uh, how, why would you do that? There's no money in that, is there? That's what everyone said. What does that have to do with selling boxes? It's the worst idea ever. So Ogilvy, who was you know an iconic PR advertising guy, was quoted as saying, "This is a waste of money. It's the, it's a stupid idea." That ca that 
campaign ran for 50 years or something. <laughs> 50 years. Yes. And 20 years in, 10 years in, Ogilvy said, it's brilliant. It's the most, that was branding. It was all about branding before anyone thought about that. So it was, who's the smartest company on the planet that makes boxes? Container Corporation of America. They're at a league of their own. They don't have to sell boxes, to your point. You buy the company. So that's, you know. Uh, you buy the experience. You buy, you, you're buying the brand. That's all, that's Apple. How much is it? I don't care. It's, it's greater than someone else, by the way. Maybe and the great idea is a Western man became this, it's in the Smithsonian. <clears throat> so well, there, yeah, but Terry, uh, Carrie, then how, how do you convince the, the person that's going to pay the bill that, look, if you go this way, it may take you five, ten years, but you're going to be iconic and put up the money now. Well, that's, you, the, that's the hard part is that still a lot of business people want to know what's the ROI. What's, that's the MBA from Harvard. Yeah. What's the return on this invested capital yeah, now? Like, when? Yeah. I, if I pay a dollar in, I need a two back and I need it like, you know, and so this is the American capitalist. So it's a quarterly, you know, like, where's our ROI? How much are we getting back? Branding is long term. It's where the big, you know, that's where you make it big. But it's you have to have a instinct about. So you got to identify the person that understands that. Mm -hmm. And there aren't too many of those individuals around. No. But those that do succeed Five stars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you hope you get one or two of those in a lifetime. Next question. John, do you have you usually have questions? What was Carrie Grady's favorite part of the interview? <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Well, let's assume there was a My part that he part? enjoyed. <laughs> um, well. It's just fun to be here. You know, when uh, Ed and I met, um, we first connected in December, I think. It was some time ago, through a mutual friend. So Peoria, I haven't been to Peoria in a while. My brother lived here a while, uh, right out of school. And, um, you know, there, you, you, for some reason, it just made a lot of sense. And, um, you know, getting to know uh, the people in the museum here and, when Ed said, oh, they have a 70-foot screen, I thought, oh, yeah, I'm sure he's exaggerating. And, uh, and he said, how would you like to do an interview in front of a 70-foot screen? I thought, no, I, I mean, that is like a horrible idea. And again, because like, I don't want to see me that, you know, like that. Um, and who would? But, and then you got here, I thought, it really is. You know, it's, it's a huge screen. But then, you know, it's, it's a, again, a comfort level. So... The only reason to do this is, you know, maybe in that conversation, there's, you know, we we do see some, you know, connections and things like that, and there's part of the story that, you know, is has some value to someone, and so that's that's the fun is, you know, it's I'm very comfortable having conversation in this environment with you, and that's that's why that's what I like about it, John. Next Wonderful. Topic. Well, thank you to Carrie Grady. Thanks to Ed Sikowski for a wonderful conversation. Insightful. Um, I did not know that your career started in that outhouse. <laughs> well, it did actually grew, start in the outhouse. And, uh, <laughs> and grew into, uh, into a magnificent, <laughs> successful career. As we saw that these magnificent slides as they played behind the interview, Thanks, for uh, Ed, for lining up the interview. Kerry Grady, you're one of us now. There's no escaping it. You're part of the Peoria Riverfront Museum. This is the first time we've looked at design um, in this way, the art of design. We look at the art of film. Uh, we certainly look at fine art and our folk art. Uh, it happens that in the building right now, uh, we feature uh, art by a fellow who started his career in graphic design named Andy Warhol who would go on to make some impact on, in the world. Pop art is the most revolutionary artist of his kind. So what a wonderful time to launch this conversation. I believe we're poised to continue in the future about the art of design. We're also looking at fashion, at graphic design, 
and many other uh, ways that the museum can hold this up. I do have to give a shout out again to Linda and Ed Sikowski for helping to put all this together. Right outside those doors is some of the most delicious food you can possibly imagine. So please come hungry to the reception where Carrie will be happy to answer further questions. I have to give a shout out to our own longstanding graphic designer, Kathy Alexander, who's here and is actually moved into the private sector herself now, but Kathy continues to do work with us on a consulting basis, but all the great uh, graphic design that's come out of the Peoria Riverfront Museum was Kathy's uh, handiwork in the last five years. So, Kathy, welcome back. And, uh, and finally, um, keep coming to the Peoria Riverfront <coughs> Museum. Is it a deal? We're a place of inspiration and telling stories that lift people up, and we appreciate you coming out on a beautiful afternoon. Uh, thank you for all your support, and see you with the SIDS sensational food. Last thing, we, we have applied our own graphic design, the logo of the museum, right on to the side of a coffee mug. <laughs> and we are now going to present that. Amanda, all the work she's done to Carrie Grady to take back to, with him. So God bless. Thanks, everybody, for coming. There you go.